I'm going to go ahead and start us off with a little introduction here. Let me share my screen. All right. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this very rainy morning. And, and I feel like in this case, it's kind of nice that we can all be in our homes and not get out in the rain. But um, this is our one of our workshop sessions. And the title of this one is Let Your Forest Be Your Food. So if you guys are new to Trees Atlanta, our mission is to protect and improve Atlanta's urban forest by planting, conservation, and education. So this is one of our education sessions. So today, Brandy Hall is going to be speaking, and she is the founder and managing director of Shades of Green Permaculture, and I'm sure she will tell you just a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so she's actually been doing three um, workshops with us and this is the last in the series that she has been doing so if you're interested in looking at the other two if you miss them you can find them on the trees atlanta youtube page if you have any difficulties at all you can just reach out to education at treesatlanta.org and we can send you those as well but these are the titles of the other ones and then of course the let the forest be your food is this the final presentation in her series so we're so excited that you guys are here and um, we would love for you guys to ask some questions at the end. So if you notice on your Zoom screen, there should be a Q&A button. If you guys could use that to answer or to ask any of your questions, that will be perfect. We can just draw them all from the same place. If you do use the chat, I will be able to grab them from there as well, but the Q&A just kind of helps keep them all in the same place. So um, please, ask your questions throughout and we'll go ahead and grab those at the end and answer them um, kind of in the order that they came in. And we want to serve you guys better. So you should be getting an email for a survey telling us how we did. And if you would um, fill that out, that would be great because we want to give you guys the best experience possible. And it's a lot easier to do that when you guys give us your feedback. So we would really appreciate that from you. And last but not least for me, um, this is our website as well as our social media handles. We would love for you guys to kind of join our family and get involved um, with volunteering and more educational sessions. So this is where you can find us if you're interested in more opportunities that are upcoming. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Brandy. Great, thank you so much, Ashley. And welcome everybody. I'm glad to be spending this Saturday morning with y'all. Um, I'm in an office that has a metal roof. So it's a little loud on my end, but it sounds like y'all can hear me based on what Ashley told me. So if not, just say something in the chat and I can try to adjust. Um, so I'm going to actually turn off my video while I share my screen because of our internet connectivity, especially while it's raining. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Um, and then I will share here. One second. Okay. And here we go. Okay. So welcome. My name is Brandy Hall, and I'm the founder and managing director of Shades of Green Permaculture, and we're based here in Avondale Estates. And today I'm going to be talking about forest gardening and all of the things that you can consider as you're designing and implementing a forest garden. And we're also going to be looking at the archetypes that forest gardens are based off of. So kind of how we're harnessing the momentum of nature and using that to the benefit of growing food and ecology. So in this workshop, you're gonna learn what to consider when building a food forest, um, such as soil and light conditions, plant palettes for productivity and soil health, and just how many incredible and productive fruits and nuts and herbs that we can grow in our climate here. So I know some of y'all have probably taken the first two or at least one of the previous workshops, but in case we haven't met yet, I wanted to just introduce myself. 
Um, like I said, my name is Brandy, and I am the founder and managing director of Shades of Green Permaculture. So we are a regenerative design installation and education company based here in Avondale Estates. And I come from a long line of builders and growers. I started as a general contractor when I was 21. Um, and I've studied as a stonemason, I've farmed, I've run nonprofits, and just generally consider myself a lifelong student. And these days, what I study is leading a purpose-driven business as a force for good. So that's something that I'm really passionate about. And here in the photos, you see my little daughter, Zephyr Dove. She's four years old. That's her on the left. Um, and on the right, that's my husband, Aaron, at our little homestead in Pine Lake, where I also serve on city council. And um, let's start with where we are going today. So first, I'm going to begin by defining the term food forest, because that's become a bit of a buzzword. And so I really want to just lay the groundwork for what are we talking about? Um, and then next, we're going to look to natural systems that food forests emulate so that we can better understand how to design for them. And then we'll discuss the many functions that you can design for in your food forest and look at examples of all the different plants that supply these functions. And after that, we're gonna get practical and I'm gonna show you some first steps that you can take to building your own food forest. And then finally, we'll have a QA and a to answer any questions you have. So I think as those questions are coming up, feel free to drop them in the chat box and Ashley's monitoring those. And then we'll have some time at the end to really dive into your questions. So let your forest be your food. I wanna begin by defining a few terms that I'm gonna be using throughout this workshop, specifically the term food forest. So what is a food forest? We hear that so many uh, places these days. So a food forest is a designed plant community built upon the woodland shrubland archetype that utilizes multiple layers of vegetation to yield food, fiber, fuel, medicine, and more. And next, something I'm gonna be talking about a little bit are plant communities. So a plant community is a diverse group of plantings that serve the ecosystem in different ways, such as nutrient distribution, varied habitat, root depth, human needs, and more. And when you're looking to develop a plant community, there are alternatives to purely ornamental plants. Um, and this is a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today. So fruit trees, medicinal and culinary herbs, perennial vegetables, ground covers, berries, fruiting vines, native trees, grasses, and flowers. Um, so all of these things help grow food, medicine, and native habitat. And planting natives specifically as part of your food forest function helps to bolster beneficial insect populations, build soil, and reduce dependence on water and chemicals. And then growing plants such as herbaceous perennials and grasses and shrubs helps to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. So it's having also a positive impact um, beyond growing food for you and your family. The next term is an annual. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about annuals and perennials. An annual is a plant that dies each year. And if it continues to spread, it does through seed dispersion. Um, it's called a self-seeding annual. So Tomatoes or calendula are a really good example of this, or Tulsi if you've, if you've grown that in this climate. <clears throat> and then next is perennials. So perennials are plants that come back year after year. They often die back to the ground each winter, but then they sprout again from the same root in the spring. So examples of this are Echinacea and Black-Eyed Susans like pictured here. And then finally, I'm gonna be talking a lot about niches. So um, a niche is a position or a role that's taken by a particular kind of organism within its community. So I use this term often to describe a plant that occupies a specific set of conditions or fills a certain role within that plant community. So now that we've got some baseline terms, I wanna dive into food forests. So food forests harness succession and disturbing dynamics disturbance dynamics, sorry. So ecological succession is the process of change in the species structure of an ecological community over time. The trajectory of ecological, ecological succession begins with disturbance and ends with climax or stabilization. So disturbance can include things like fire, flood, landslide, erosion, clearing, tilling, mowing, 
or any other event that sets the vegetative growth back to ground level, so to speak. So ecological gardening is an oscillation between succession and disturbance. This is really relevant to your gardening decisions because as you plan for a long-term landscape, it's helpful to know where nature's headed if left to our own devices. So in order to harness succession as an asset in your garden, you can look to the wild spaces to see what the climax ecosystem is. And so in the temperate zones of the Southeast where we are, it's typically forest. Um, in the Midwest, it would be grassland and so on. So nature's momentum is moving toward that climax expression at all points. For example, here, if you were to bush hog a field or stop mowing your lawn, what happens? Um, here in the Southeast, you begin to see early succession species moving in like sweet gum and poplar saplings. And then the field or lawn eventually moves toward reforestation. So how does succession impact maintenance? If you're trying to maintain a, a garden in an entirely disturbed state, meaning you're thwarting that natural trajectory toward ecological stabilization or the climax ecosystem, the forest, then you're ultimately creating a lot of work for yourself. So disturbance in most residential landscapes is maintained through either mowing or weeding, tilling if you're doing some gardening. And on the other hand, without disturbance, you can really see here, especially in Atlanta, a flourishing of aggressive species, or even feel like your house is about to be consumed by plants. So then how do you utilize both succession and disturbance in planning your landscape, in your forest garden? So you can begin by identifying the areas where it's important to have open space, sight lines, and managed plantings on your site. And then next, look to areas that you can encourage a move toward stabilization or toward forest. And then designing your ecological and edible landscape with succession in mind is often called forest gardening. So let's look to the layers of the forest. Since forest gardens are mimicking climax ecosystems or a movement toward climax ecosystem, then it's really important to know what the, what the components of that ecosystem are when we're talking about plant structures. So as you begin to read vegetation on your site, it's really helpful to understand the layers of a temperate or deciduous forest. So this also comes in handy later if you're thinking about plant choices and also as these layers offer an opportunity for growing space. So the first layer are the overstory trees, the canopy species. And these are typically over 40 feet tall. And then we have understory trees um, that are between 15 and 40 feet tall. So those are things like dogwoods and redwood and redbuds. The overstory trees around here, you see a lot are oaks and poplars and sweet gums and magnolias, lots of different things. And then shrubs, which typically range between six and 20 feet. So that's a really large range. Um, and then you have the herbaceous layer, which includes ferns, grasses, forbs, and this tends to be between one and six feet high. And then vines, which we're all familiar with, which climb the trees and shrubs. And then ground cover, which is typically referred to as the plants that are less than a foot tall. And then finally, the rhizosphere or the root zone, which is the, the growing layer beneath the soil. <clears throat> Excuse me. So forest gardening is utilizing the layers of the forest to grow fruits, nuts, berries, perennial vegetables, culinary and medicinal herbs. And incorporating the seven layers of a forest into your plan reduces maintenance and utilizes nature's momentum. So another way to approach this is through the lens of landscape archetypes which I wanna dive into here. So landscape archetypes informed our design plant communities and our emotional response to them. So you may be familiar with the book, Planting in a Post Wild World, written by Claudia West and Thomas Rayner. And in that book, they explain various archetypal landscapes, forests, woodlands and shrublands and grasslands, and also the emotions that they conjure. 
So I'm going to take that information in the next few slides, and these can become the architectural pattern that we build on as we um, begin to discuss forest gardening. So in order to emulate the natural system, let's understand what the components are of that specific landscape archetype. So the one that we're going to be studying today right now um, is the archetype of woodlands and shrublands. So this is defined as a lack of consistent tree canopy. As a climax ecosystem, they generally receive less rainfall than forests, but more than grasslands. So the Shrublands are not necessarily our climax ecosystem. Our climax e ecosystem is moving toward forest, but we're holding forest gardens in sort of a suspended, a suspended state of succession by managing them as shrublands. And I'm gonna show you some photos like this one. And I want you to kind of pause for a moment and just tune into the emotional impact and the felt sense that you get from this type of landscape. One thing to note about um, woodlands and shrublands is that they include a wide variety of light conditions and microclimates, which is what makes them such um, verdant growing spaces. So here we go. Just kind of tune into the, the felt sense. So in a passage from their book, West and Rayner describe the emotional impact and the desires that are fulfilled by woodlands. This is what they say. I'm gonna read a little passage from it. So archetypal woodlands combine the visual clarity of low height grasslands with the shelter provided by scattered trees or shrubs. Their visually open expressions are highly appealing. The introduction of low shrubs and trees adds a hint of complexity and mystery. Yet the wide spacing and open nature of the vegetation keeps this complexity from overwhelming you. The experience of moving through these landscapes is rhythmic. Scattered trees and shrubs create a mosaic of human scaled spaces. As you walk through woodlands, room-like enclosures open into wide expanses, which close again into dense shrubby vegetation. It's a landscape of contrast, openings and closings alternating light and dark, warm and cool, sun and shade. While contemporary planting design gravitates toward grasslands as an inspiration, woodlands and shrublands are underutilized points of reference. They're vegetative models of human scaled spaces, making them one of the more engaging landscapes to be in. The grand scale of grasslands and forests can make them difficult to translate for small urban and suburban landscapes. But the room-like quality of woodlands and shrublands, particularly the tight tree clusters adjacent to open fields, works remarkably well for suburban contexts, suggestive of the way planting and paths might frame open lawns. So let's look at the layers of woodlands and shrublands. We've got the canopy layer. And these are the vertical elements, um, usually individual specimens, clumps, or small groups of trees. There's space enough between the trees that they have more unique and wide growth habits than their forest counterparts. So there's light that's hitting the floor um, or the ground layer because of the spacing of the canopy. And then the woody layer, which are the woody shrubs and woody perennials that fill the understory zone near the trees, which are maximizing the sunlight. And then finally, the herbaceous layer. So this is sometimes indistinguishable from the more woody perennial species in the woody layer. Um, and then the space, space beneath the trees and shrubs is often densely covered or more shade tolerant species. Um, while open swatches can resemble grasslands. So species in this layer are generally really adaptive to the changing light and of the light availability. So problems to avoid in designing woodlands. 
Blurred layers can really look unmanaged. So creating distinct layers is an important piece of designing an aesthetically appealing food forest. Um, and then also poor spatial composition, meaning lack of balance in the distribution of layers. So the shrublands and woodlands have a very symmetrical distribution of vertical and lower species. And then next, let's talk about edges. So edges occur both naturally and as a result of disturbance or man-made features. So you may have multiple archetypal landscapes on your site, for instance, a deep forest with few clearings or mostly wooded woodland backyard or a grassland full of, you know, sun, full sun front yard. So if you're building a food forest, the woodland shrubland is filled with edges between shade and sun. And at the intersection of different landscape archetypes, for instance, woodlands abutting um, grassland, there's an edge that's really fertile because species from both types of those ecosystems can thrive in that veld zone between the two. So some of the most fertile habitats on earth are edge zones, like estuaries. Edges are a really huge asset when you're planning a forest garden. Next, each landscape is underlaid within this wet to dry gradient and also a shade to sun gradient. And specific plantings respond to the various soil moisture and light conditions. So they can become a site specific expression of the plant community, which leads me to reading existing conditions as the basis for responsive design, which is what we're gonna get into now. So why it's important to read existing conditions on your site. It's really helpful as you begin to design your food forest that you consider the site as a whole. Um, so these aren't things that, this isn't something that exists in just a tiny little you know, corner. So you wanna look at um, water flow and light and moisture and how you know, folks are circulating on your property. You don't necessarily need full sun to achieve a food forest, but you do need to know the site conditions that you're working with so that you can plan for appropriate plants and figure out exactly what you'll need to do to implement the plantings. So I'm gonna go through some of the conditions that you'll want to take note of, whether it's in a map, um, like I'm suggesting here, or um, just some notes. These are things that are gonna inform your next, uh, your next step to building a food forest. So condition one, when you're taking stock of existing vegetation, start with patterns to details. So the overstory to the ground cover. So existing vegetation notes um, include ground cover, lawn areas, herbs, shrubs, trees. What species do you see in each of the layers of your forest, if you have forest? Um, are there plants that you wanna keep where they are, plants that you might wanna transplant, vegetation that needs to be removed? If so, thinking about how you're gonna manage that um, removed vegetation as a resource. So just taking stock of your existing vegetation. And also plants tell us a lot about what's going on with the soil. For instance, if we're growing, you know, if we live in a pine forest, that soil tends to be very acidic. Um, so taking note of what your vegetation is will also give you information about well, how to plan for um, your food forest. Condition two are aggressive species. So have you identified aggressive species in your landscape that you need to respond to in your planting? Um, having a method for continuing to kind of like keep them at bay or reclaim an area from say wisteria, like in this photo, um, might take some upfront maintenance to try to get that going and then planning for what's going to replace it. Um, Three, the existing tree line. So when I'm mapping, I usually draw this in, showing the reach of the canopy, which just gives you like a visual representation of the light conditions when the sun is straight overhead. So knowing kind of already what's existing as um, sun and shade on your site will help you in your planning. Next, identify the animal stakeholders. So what animals support and are supported by this ecosystem? Like for instance, I live in under the canopy of several very large oak trees. 
Um, and so we have a huge squirrel population. And that's something to take note of when I'm when I was planning our fruit trees. Um, we planted things that are very prolific fruiters, knowing that the squirrels were going to take a lot of them. And they do. We have a few pear trees and they just leave us like a quarter of the harvest and that's okay. <laughs> um, so this will help you identify what types of critters you're working with as you're building your garden. So thinking about the kinds of um, animals that like to interact, whether it's deer or chipmunks or squirrels. And next, consider soil moisture. So there are a lot of nuances to plant communities that you encounter, but the two primary factors that determine how plants express themselves within an ecosystem are the soil moisture and the light availability. So I define soil moisture as follows. Wet, which means there's standing water. Mesic, which is well hydrated, but no standing water after about 12 hours of a rain event. And then dry, which is no standing water and well drained. And then the next is light availability. So I define light availability as shade being less than three hours of direct light, partial between three to five hours of direct light, and then full sun more than five hours of direct light. And there's obviously a lot of nuance to that, like dappled light versus direct light. But these are kind of good goalposts, I think, when you're choosing your plant species um, and ways that you can take note of what's happening on your site. So taking note of the patches of light and shadow in different seasons is really important as well. And there are some apps that you can use. There's one called Lumos, L-U-M-O-S, um, that you can download, it's free. I know they have it for iPhone, I believe for Android as well. And you basically can hold it up to the sky and see at different times of the year what the position of the sun is at different hours of the day and see if it's obstructed by trees or buildings. And that can give you can like spot readings on your site, um, you know, for winter and for summer, for spring and for fall. And then finally, condition number seven are the ecotypes and planting zones. So I bring this up because within residential landscapes, you encounter certain structural elements such as foundation plantings, a certain amount of evergreen plantings, contiguous planting areas, hedgerows, privacy screens, lawn space, border plantings, woodland edges that are all helpful to identify as you're mapping your existing conditions. Um, later on, as you plan your plantings, you may wanna build upon or overhaul some of these more architectural elements and incorporate them into your food production and your edible landscape. Also, if you live in an HOA or a historic district, sometimes aspects of the more structural elements of landscaping can be regulated. So for an example, uh, many HOAs require a certain percentage of evergreen plantings to have um, or to have defined contiguous planting beds. So if you live in an HOA or historic district, it's worth just pulling up the bylaws or ordinances so that you know what's required. Um, and then there are lots of ways to get creative so you can work within the design constraints. And when you're working on a residential scale, you can almost think of your entire landscape as a food forest. If you're moving toward, you know, um, trees and shrubs that are edible and building out the understory. And we're going to talk all about that. So as you continue, can, ugh pardon me, <laughs> as you continue to analyze your existing conditions, it's gonna be really helpful um, to identify the various ecotypes and planting zones within your landscape. So this helps you to craft your plant palette for your food forest. So like I said, you don't need full sun, full sun, dry, well-drained soils to do a food forest. It's really about picking nuanced plant species with the aims of building soil, food production, habitat, all of these things that become the elements of a food forest. And so the ecotypes that you'll identify include nine combinations of light availability and soil moisture. And then of those zones that you identify on your site, you can make lists of different planting areas that you have within these ecotypes. So here, for instance, if we look at this graph, we've got the light on the left uh, and the soil moisture on the top. So there are plants that fill full sun, wet soil conditions. And then, you know, the opposite of that, there are plants that fill full shade, 
dry soil conditions and then everything in between. So identifying, you know, whether it's just making spots on your map or um, taking notes of all these existing conditions, identifying these different um, ecotypes is gonna be really helpful in choosing the right plants for your forest garden. And then the main thing to consider when you're designing your forest garden is don't plant plants, plant ecosystems. And you do this by creating polycultures. So what's a polyculture? Or uh, permaculturists like to call it a guild. A polyculture, which is also known as a plant guild, um, is a diverse plant community that utilizes plants that serve multiple functions. So I'm gonna go through what those functions are. What are some of the most common functions within a polyculture? Some of these are gonna be really self-explanatory and some I'll explain in a little bit more detail. I'm also gonna give you some examples of plants that fill each of these functions that grow well in our climate. So the first function in a food forest, this is maybe an obvious one, is food. So fruit trees such as pear or apple or pomegranate or fig or service berry. And I really recommend diversifying the families that you're pulling your fruits from, your fruit and nut trees. Nut trees are another example. So hazelnuts, American chestnut hybrids, chinkapin chestnut. And as you're diversifying your families, so most of the fruits that we eat are in the rose family. So apples and strawberries and um, pears and peaches and cherries and plums. And that means because they're in the same family, they can spread pests and diseases between one another. So if you insert plants that are outside of that family, um, for instance, pomegranate or fig or hazelnut or chestnut, things that are in various families, and you intersperse them when you're, when you're designing in your trees and shrubs, then that'll help the cull the spread of pests and diseases. Um, it's based on a, a planting a pattern in nature um, called cross-pollination clusters, where species tend to be close enough together to cross-pollinate, but far enough apart that they're hedging their bets in terms of um, pests and diseases. <clears throat> also, you can include berry bushes, which are things like blueberries and aronia, also known as chokeberry. Fruiting vines like hardy kiwi or muscadine or thornless blackberry. Perennial vegetables like asparagus and horseradish. Annual vegetables like tomato or eggplant or squash. You have annual culinary and medicinal herbs like basil and calendula. And then perennial culinary and medicinal herbs like rosemary or lavender or bronze fennel. And the second function is medicine. So annual medicinal plants such as tulsi and calendula or perennial medicinal herbs like rosemary or bronze fennel or mint. These are things that you can incorporate as one of the functions. Function three, soil builders. So this includes nitrogen fixers, dynamic accumulators and decompactors. So nitrogen fixers are plants that host bacteria on their roots that take atmospheric nitrogen and then fix it in a usable form. So examples of plants um, that do this are things in the pea family and clover and red bud. <clears throat> and then we also have dynamic accumulators, which pull nutrients from deeper in the soil and make them available to more shallow rooted plants. So examples of this are comfrey and yarrow and nettle and dandelion. And then decompactors, which are plants that have bulbous roots that tend to break up the soil so that water can infiltrate. And a lot of these are cover crops, which are seeds that you might put down to help prepare the soil for future plantings. So things like turnips and daikon radish are great decompactors, especially if you're working with really um, compacted intense clay. Function four, pest management. So pest management through the use of aromatics, such as mints, and this can help control common pests that seek fruit when the ripe smell is on the air, as the volatile oils help to deter them. So aromatics can also help with things like mosquito control. And examples of this would be lemongrass or mint or sage or lavender, which is pictured here. 
Another function that a plant plays within an ecosystem is beauty. Um, and when habitats and landscapes are beautiful, we also tend to engage with them more. So this is an important element that um, can't really be ignored. So examples of this are a lot of showy pollinator plants like echinacea or milkweed or some annuals like pictured here, sunflower. The next function is ground cover or living mulch. So having ground cover and living mulch helps to keep the soil moist, which reduces the need to irrigate. Um, and examples of that would be clover, which is what, this is an annual clover, crimson clover, that's um, pictured here, but there's also red clover, which is medicinal, and those are nitrogen fixing, or Dutch white clover. Um, also things like pennyroyal, which is a creeping mint, or creeping thyme. These are all examples of ground covers. Another function are fiber and crafts. So plants that are good for clothes making or rope making or natural dyeing or soap making, things like yucca, um, that's a great plant for making soap and also for making rope. Another function is fodder. So this is for domesticated animals like bunnies or chickens. An example of this might be an annual like sorghum or comfrey, which is perennial. Function nine, fuel. So plants for firewood, wood that can be coppiced easily, such as black locust or honey locust. Um, coppicing is when you chop it down to the ground um, and then it sends out stump sprouts from the ground. So if you've ever worked with honey locust, you can cut it back and then it sends out sprouts again and again. Um, some, most plants, most woody plants will respond well to coppicing to a certain age. Um, and then some don't, but ones that are really great for firewood are, or fence posts or um, other things are honey locust, which grows really well here, or black locust, which um, for fence posts can be put in the ground and last 75 years untreated. So it's a really, a really valuable, super dense hardwood. Function 10 is forage for wildlife. So things such as berries and seeds, like beautyberry and mulberry. And nectaries, function 11. So this is for pollinators, such as bees, certain wasps, hummingbirds, and more. So plants like cardinal flower, or native honeysuckle, or mountain mint, which is really important to the bumblebee, which is endangered. Function 12, habitat. So this would be habitats such as beneficial insects or songbird shelter, things like native grasses do a great, a great job of providing um, winter structure for beneficial insects. So grasses like muley or little blue stem. And then finally, structure. So <clears throat> this would be plants that provide shade or windbreak or privacy. So examples of these might be evergreen shrubs like pineapple guava, which is also fruiting, or tea olive, which flowers in the winter and is great forage for bees that time of year, or American beech, um, which keeps its leaves through the winter and can provide windbreak and privacy and ultimately become a shade tree. So that's a lot of functions. We just named 13 different functions that plants can play within your landscape um, and within the food forest. So the question is, how do you incorporate these functions into your planning? Might be a little overwhelming, but a great rule of thumb is to choose each plant in your palette only if it fills at least three functions. So this helps to build resilience because you have multiple functions filled by mul multiple plants. And it also builds diversity and helps you maximize your growing space. So there are a lot of permaculturists that teach a method of building guilds that meets multiple functions at the base of every single tree. Um, and when I was first learning, I did this and I quickly learned two things. That one, it's difficult to manage and two, it looks kind of messy to most people. 
So then I began to experiment thinking of residential sites or a portion of a site more as a polyculture rather than the site of each individual tree. So within each planting area, we seek to fill at least three functions and as many as possible within the entire site. So over the past decade, I've learned that this is both a more approachable way to gardening for forest gardening specifically for most people, and it generally feels more organized and beautiful. And then taking into consideration designing for symmetry in the canopy layer and um, the ground layer, like we were talking about in the landscape archetype slides. Uh, and then after a lot of observation, I've seen that the same benefits emerge on a site when it's managed either way. You have better soil, there are more pollinators, there's more food produced, the biodiversity of the site is increased, and there's more drought resistance and less pests. So that's the benefit of thinking about multiple functions. And planting design is like this Venn diagram, form and function, and where they overlap is resilience. So as you're planning a productive forest garden, you might also want to consider annuals as part of the overall food system that you're creating. So I didn't want to leave this part out. Um, some people choose to integrate annual vegetables into their planting beds and others separate out annual production. Um, for maintenance reasons. So there are a few ways that you can do it and they all have pros and cons. This um, list I'm gonna go through, it's not exhaustive, but these are our top four methods of growing annual vegetables that you might wanna consider um, and the pros and cons of each. So the first method, which I'm sure you're really familiar with are raised beds. And these are usually constructed out of wood or stone. And the pros, are that they're really easy to manage and they keep grass out. And then you can also make them tall so you don't have to bend down to harvest as much. And then the cons, as I would say, that um, the wood can wick moisture out of the soil. So it can create a situation where you're having to water more often. And then also the stone, if you make them out of stone, it can heat up the soil, um, which can dehydrate the soils as well. So those are some, some things to think about with raised beds. The second method is hugel beds. So you might have heard this term before, but if not, hugel beds are mounded beds that are constructed with a base layer of rotting wood. So that helps to hold soil moisture and build nutrients. So the pros are that they reduce the need to irrigate and they also help to manage erosion because you can build them on contour. So if you're working on a slope and you have a lot of water coming down the slope, you can, you know, you could do veggie gardening there by creating a hugel mound, um, like a raised contoured bed and then plant your veggies in that. So you're kind of filling multiple functions through growing in hugel beds. Um, but the cons I would say are that they're really labor intensive to build. Um, you know, we happen to be a city in a forest that has a lot of downed wood, so that's a, a benefit. The material's easy to find, but it's, it's more challenging to build. It involves a lot of digging and moving stuff, moving material. And if you wanna know more about hugel beds, I have a blog post, I can put the link at the end um, if you wanna read more about specifically how those are constructed or, and what the benefits are and see some examples. And then the third method are in-ground beds. So the pros of in-ground beds are that they really reduce the need to irrigate and that they're easy to build and that you're continuously investing in your soil. Um, and then the cons, oops, sorry. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> excuse me. And the cons are that they can be more management intensive and can, and can, and can succumb to weeds more easily. Um, you know, if you, have, if you have vegetables growing in the ground, you might have ground cover that creeps in. So you kind of have to stay on top of um, the weeding there, which is a con if you don't have much time. And then the last method are integrated planting beds. So the pros are that you can grow in small pockets of light throughout your yard. Um, you know, if your site is anything like mine, we have a couple of places that get six hours of sun or more, you know, very small areas. And so um, 
one of them happens to be pretty linear. So on our house, we built a taller raised bed that also serves as a fence so that our dog can't get into the yard part of the, um, the grass part of our yard. Um, but we're growing in these pockets of light. So if you integrate your plantings, integrate your vegetable growing and planting beds, the pros are that you can grow them in the small pockets of light that are throughout your yard. So even if you don't have a lot of sunlight, there are usually places where there's some. And you can also add lots of seasonal color to your planting beds by introducing annual veggies and flowers. Um, so that's definitely a pro. But the cons of this are that they might be a little bit more difficult to manage um, or harvest from if they're spread out all over the place. So uh, this type of veggie gardening really calls you to be outside and in your garden, kind of observing what's going on and harvesting and being on top. It's kind of like a I think of the squirrels, the way they harvest all of the acorns and then hide them all over in the ground. And then they only remember where like, you know, 5% of them are. My experience of doing integrated planting, um, you know, sometimes I forget what all I planted and where it is. So I don't really, I can't really keep track of um, whether or not it's doing well sometimes. So that's a con I would say. So what are some actionable steps to build your own food forest? All, I wanna just talk a little bit here. So all regenerative design, whether you're doing forest gardening or not, is based on what I like to refer to as the three pillars of a regenerative landscape. So this is something that I've distilled through years and years and years of working with permaculture, just kind of breaking it down to the three simple things that are pillars of all regenerative landscapes. So I'm gonna go through these really quickly. Um, if you've been in any of the past, the last, um, Workshop, I talked more at length about these, but I'll just go through them here. So the first pillar is manage water as a resource to rehydrate soils, reduce irrigation, and restore the water cycle. So you do this by slowing it, sinking it, and spreading it. That's the simple mantra. So uh, working with water, the directive when you're working with water in your landscape and how that integrates into a food forest or any regenerative landscape is that you wanna slow the water down. You wanna give it opportunity to sink into the soil rather than running off into the storm drains. And then you wanna spread it out through your landscape. You don't wanna concentrate it. You wanna distribute that water more evenly through your landscape. So I wanna show you some ways that you can do this. Working smarter, not harder, which is an adage that I'm really happy about, <laughs> like to refer to often. Um, so you can reduce the need to irrigate by choosing appropriate plants, which we're talking a lot about, and choosing plants that are well adapted to your garden's conditions, which sets them up to thrive without costly irrigation. And then also directing stormwater strategically through the yard so you're hydrating your soils. Building the soil's capacity to hold and store water helps to mitigate the effects of drought. So infiltrating water helps keeps forests and ecosystems intact. It recharges aquifers and it regulates the extremes of drought and flood. So when water is managed as a resource, the landscape as a whole can withstand drought and flood and is more resilient. And you can reduce irrigation needs by planting at the appropriate time of year, which we'll talk a little bit about later, planting smaller plants so that they establish without as many inputs, maintaining ground cover to retain soil moisture, watering deeply and infrequently to encourage root growth and really encourage those deep roots. And then also using rainwater preferentially for irrigation and then directing the overflow to where it's useful and can infiltrate during heavier rains. So you can spread and sink water by doing things like building rain gardens. And these are all things that can be integrated into your food forest, but building rain gardens to passively irrigate planting areas. You can also grow lots and lots of food producing plants in rain gardens like elderberry and mulberry and rosa rugosa, which has an incredible rose hip um, on it. So building rain gardens. And rain gardens, just to describe what they are, they are basins in your yard. Um, that are designed to receive water and then allow it to infiltrate into the soil. And they're different than ponds because they, um, they don't hold water like a pond does. So they're generally planted with lots of beautiful and hardy plants that can just take the flood drought continuum. 
So examples of this are muley grass and marsh hibiscus and liatris and a lot of plants that can kind of go on the, on the extremes of flood and drought. The next thing you could do to slow and sink water and spread it through your landscape are, by, are to dig swales on contour. So these slow water down. And swales are basins with a berm that are, it's on the downhill side of the ditch. The basin is along the contour line. Um, spreads out horizontally along the contour line, which is perpendicular to the slope. And then the berm is on the downhill side of that. And what that does is it slows the water down as it's coming down the hill and spreads it horizontally along the slope, which also helps to stop erosion. And you're slowing that water down and allowing it to infiltrate into the um, zone, the root zone of the plants. So you're irrigating passively. Passively meaning you're not having to do it. Nature is doing the irrigating for you. You're just giving the water the opportunity to sink in. And then finally, digging diversion swales, um, which directs water where it's useful. So, um, you know, oftentimes the water is directed right toward our foundations. We have so many clients that have flooding crawl spaces and things like that. So instead, we can take that water and then direct it somewhere else using diversion swales where it's going to be useful and then can go into rain gardens or so on and so forth. Um, so examples of diversion swales are dry creek beds or bioswales, which are vegetated. <coughs> Excuse me. So the second pillar, which is one that we've been talking a lot about so far in this presentation, is to preserve and restore biodiversity by building plant communities. So planning for a variety of the functions that I outlined previously. And just to recap, these functions are food, medicine, soil building, beauty, ground cover and living mulch, fiber and craft plantings, fodder, fuel, forage for wildlife, nectaries, habitat, and structure. And then the third pillar of a regenerative landscape is to integrate waste as a resource to build soil fertility and create resilience. So it's really important to build the soil, whether you're planting in it yet or not, there are so many ways to build soil. You can leave your leaves in place. Um, you can do a method called chopping and dropping where you put a cover crop down like daikon radish, like we discussed earlier, which can decompact the soil or buckwheat, which is a wonderful bee forage in the great summertime crop, or winter pea, which fixes nitrogen into the soil and helps build the soil fertility. And then chopping it means that you're cutting it down to the ground when its season is over. So those are annuals that I was just describing. And then you can do something called sheet mulching, where maybe you're putting your leaves down and then you're putting all your cardboard boxes broken down on top of that, and then covering it with compost or wood chips or, um, leaving that organic matter from the cover crop to decompose and add organic matter into the soil. Um, so building your soil, regardless of whether or not you're planting yet, is a really, really important thing to do. And is really the first step that you can go, even if you're still designing your plant communities or figuring out where you want to do your food forests, or um, you can just continually be working on the soil. And that's really the basis for all productive systems is having really healthy, good soil. And healthy, good soil means that it's both fertile, it's very nutrient rich, and it's also able to hold more water. Um, so two things that are really important there. And here are some steps to building your food forest. First, take inventory, like we were talking about. Identify the existing conditions. Um, take inventory of your plants. Take inventory of the soils, the types of animals that you see partaking in your landscape. Um, because once you kind of understand what the existing conditions are, then you can make a design that's responsive and make necessary design decisions um, based on that. The next thing you can do is use your water as an asset, like I was just talking about. Commit to building soil. And then make site-specific plant lists that fill niches and functions. Um, so you want to try to, you know, if we're doing your food forest in your backyard, try to fill all of the functions in some way or another um, that I was describing before. And then also the final one is just be patient. 
I think that's a huge piece in slow landscapes, um, being patient because these things don't happen overnight. Um, you're working with perennials, which take you know a couple of years to establish and fruit trees, which take a few years to bear fruit. These are, um, you're kind of playing the long game in gardening when you're designing a food forest. So that's something to consider and keep in mind. So when you're overlapping the frameworks of existing conditions, the landscape archetypes that I was talking about earlier and functions, this yields a unique expression of your landscape's intelligence. One that marries form, function, food and medicine production, soil building and water management. So the intersection of these three ways of approaching landscape design is what builds resilience in the form of a truly regenerative landscape. So I wanna show you a couple of projects that illustrate all of these possibilities working together from through the lens of um, a food forest. So I talked about these uh, some of these projects last time in our um, case studies, but I wanna talk about them through the lens of choosing plant communities today and how all of these things work together. So the first um, that I wanna describe is what we call the edible oasis. So this is a property indicator that we did a few years ago. This photo was taken maybe two years after the installation. Um, and I wanna show you of what we were working with before and then describe some of the site challenges. So here are, um, the before photos. Um, this is the back of the house. Um, and you can see there's a shared driveway. There's a lot of water. The low spot in her house is in um, of her, the low spot of all of those uh, shared properties, the backyards um, is at this client's house. You can see on the far left, the picture of the driveway um, where there's some staining from the um, soil that was washing out. So that's actually the low spot. So all of these properties that, I, that you can see on the right-hand side drain via the shared driveway and the lawn um, over to um, the driveway there. And then there was just kind of some interesting water management things that were happening. You know, the builder made a dry well, which is basically like a big gravel pit that directs all of the water from the downspouts so that it can sink into the ground um, and it was just undersized for the amount of water that comes off of the roof. And so it, what was happening, it was just backing up and then shooting out of that coupling that you see in the center photo, that's like right at the top of the brick wall. Um, and then that was taking with it all of the soil, which was then washing into her, into her garage. So one of the things that we needed to do was deal with, was manage the water. Um, and even the kind of the way of thinking about managing water using dry wells, which is a really common builder practice these days um, because of the city of Atlanta's one inch mandate. Um, it's still kind of approaching water as a nuisance. So the idea is still to like get it away from the house and then just like put it in a pit and let it sink back in. And it's better than sending it to the stormwater. Don't get me wrong. Um, to the stormwater infrastructure where then it floods creeks and streams and ends up in you know Mississippi. Um, becomes your neighbor's problem essentially. But it's still thinking of water as like, get it, you know, kind of deal with it and get it away. And another way to work with the water instead, which is what I was describing, is to distribute it through the landscape. So it's actually hydrating your soils and you, you know, the plants that you're planting are using the water. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so this was the design. This is the water system on the right where we took the downspouts and we routed it to a cistern and then had that overflow um, through rain gardens in the front yard. Um, we also directed some of the water kind of at the bottom of the water plan there, the one that's grayed out with the blue. Um, the bottom of that, you see this, this line that says diversion swale. So that was just taking water from the driveway and then turning that diversion swale on contour so it could hydrate some of the fruit trees that we planted there. And then the, um, planting design that we went for. So I chose this one because it's very much a food forest that's the scale of the full residential site here. Um, so we planted lots and lots of fruit trees like pomegranate and fig and service berry and pineapple guava and um, 
apples. I believe we planted a couple of apples. We had lots of shrubs, like I was describing before, like blueberries and aronia, um, tons and tons of native plants like bee balm and black eyed Susan and um, river oats and cardinal flower and mountain mint and little blue stem and mealy grass and echinacea and milkweed. So just like overflowing with plants that fill tons and tons of functions within the landscape. And then also lots of food bearing plants. So this is just a view of the rain gardens. Um, so we're tapping the downspouts which is the photo on the right hand side and they go into cisterns and then that gravity feeds to the front yard and it goes into a rain garden and this rain garden has um, river oats and which is a native grass it's got saint john's wort which is medicinal it has um, liatris which is a native pollinator attracting and supporting plant it's got some native ferns um, and then the the rain garden in the bottom right hand side so thinking about how water management can intersect with food production. It's kind of the point of this. So you can, you know, on this lower slide, what we are the lower photo in the slide, what we did is we created a low spot that was not her driveway so that the water that did end up from all the neighboring properties onto the driveway had somewhere to slowly sink in and infiltrate. And so this was right after heavy rain. So you can see there's standing water in it, but it will, um, you know, within eight hours or so, fully drain into the soils. And this plant has, or this um, rain garden has Rosa rugosa and elderberry, which are just small at this point um, when these photos were taken and liatris and some other really wonderful plants that are both food producing, medicinal, um, pollinator attracting, all of these things and working to manage water. And here are some examples of some of the plants in this landscape. So we've got strawberry, which is a living ground cover, wonderful ground cover in this case. Um, and it's also food producing. So one of the reasons the client wanted to plant this is because she wanted to have some privacy along, it's a busier street. Um, so she wanted to have some privacy. So we planted a hedgerow of pineapple guava, which is in the center top photo. Um, and then the understory of that pineapple guava is is strawberry. So she wanted privacy, but she also wanted to engage the neighborhood as people were walking by and um, really invite them to harvest. So she's, she's texts me pictures sometimes of the hauls that they get of their strawberries um, this time of year. They're just now starting to come in, I guess. Um, and it's pretty inspiring and just the kind of the framework of planting for some privacy, but then also sharing the abundance, I think is a really um, powerful way to approach plantings in this particular situation. And then we have apple there on the right. Um, this is an heirloom variety of apple. And then milkweed, uh, butterfly milkweed on the on the bottom photo there, which is great for pollinator support, specifically the monarch butterfly. It's a food source for the migrating monarch butterfly. Um, and there's some other examples here. That's another view of the um, hedgerow of pineapple guava and um, strawberry in the center. You can see just how like rich and wonderful the soil has become through that living ground cover. Um, when we were starting the, the first photos that I showed you, it was just like builder grade clay, you know, post grading and just put down some, put down some pine straw, stick a couple shrubs in the ground. And um, really what we wanted to do is continue to work on the soil because that ultimately helps to grow wonderful plants um, and wonderful plants help to grow wonderful soil. So it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship for sure. And then there in the photo on the right, that's actually the diversion swale that turns onto a contoured swale. What you don't see is a fig kind of more in the foreground, um, but this is covered in liatris and um, mint and mountain mint and some pollinator other pollinator plants like bee balm and the milkweed there on the bottom. Um, so just loaded with really productive native plants, many of which are um, medicinal or edible. So another way I wanna talk about a food forest, another example of this, um, this is a project, this is the before photo. Um, so it's a 
you know, another kind of post-construction landscape. This is down in Fayetteville, south of Atlanta. It's a lot of pine forest um, and a lot of uh, residual clay from the grading and then the ground cover never really took the grass they put down on it. So it's just a lot of uh, eroding clay, um, really lacking organic matter. And then this particular site, the house, which is the, this photo is taken from the perspective of standing at the back of the house. Um, so all the downspouts just kind of go through uh, the grating and the lawn and then go down to um, a wet spot um, that was also just exposed clay. It's the lowest part on the property and there may or may not be a spring in that area as well. Um, so what we wanted to do, here's a, the plan here. So you've got the residence. I was standing at the back of the house, which is kind of where it says lawn um, and then planning. They're planning for a pool in that area at some point, but looking up to the hill there. So we designed this. It's more of an orchard in that it's contained within, um, you know, a pretty clear area, specifically with fruit trees and berries and um, shrubs and things. Uh, but the way all of this works together, what we did is we took the downspouts from the um, house and we routed it through a system called an inverted siphon. If you want to know more about that, you can talk or you can watch the first of the workshop series that I did, um, the rainwater harvesting for home scale projects. Um, so we ran that seemingly uphill, but all via gravity without any pumps into a tank, into a cistern. And then that cistern overflows through these contoured swales, which are represented by the blue lines kind of along the upper hillside in the top part of this photo. Um, and then those are also capturing the overground water as it's coming down the hill. Um, and then we chose species and separated them out with plants that are of um, different families, that cross-pollination cluster that I was talking about before. So you can see there's Asian cherry or there's Asian pear and cherry and plum, but those are separated by things like pomegranate and fig and red bud, um, loquat, uh, blue, blueberries, service berries, hazelnut, so pineapple guava, things that are all of different families besides the rose family plants. So the intention behind this, and this is a, something that we've done over and over again with lots of clients building orchards, really, really reduces and isolates um, any pests specifically that, that spread easily through rose family plants. So for instance, I did a project you know, 15 years ago using this um, and it's a using this model and it's a project in Hartwell, Georgia, and it's a 55 tree orchard and it, the property is surrounded by red cedars and there are a lot of apples and pears, both of which get rust from the red cedars. Um, and in the 10 in the 15 years since we we did the project it's there's been one apple tree that has gotten rust and it's one that's closest in proximity to the to the cedars that are in the back of the property and it's never spread to any of the other ones um, and then there was one asian pear that got fire blight and it never spread to any of the other um, plants so it's a really powerful model when you're designing for fruit production specifically to be able to kind of mitigate the spread of pests and diseases. Um, and then what we did with the soil here and in terms of um, growing the plants, so I'm gonna go to this next slide. So this is immediately after construction. Um, this one was just constructed this past winter. So, you know, no green in this photo, but you can see all of the straw. So we chose uh, native pollinator, um, meadow mix for rebuilding the soil and also helping to boost um, fruit production. And that's loaded with plants like mountain mint and echinacea that have medicinal herb, herb qualities. Um, and then tons of native pollinator attracting plants like goldenrod and native grasses and things that are really gonna help to build that soil back over time. Um, and so that's what this project was. And that's the cistern there. It's a very short, wide cistern and it's buried about two feet um, in the ground there to be able to get the drop from the downspouts on the house.
And then the last project that I want to just touch on before we finish is the Monday Night Garage. So this is an urban orchard. I don't know if you've been there. Um, specifically designed for fruit production around making sour beers. This is the before photo. This is an aerial of the site before. So you can see just like, you know, it's in the warehouse district on the west side um, near the Beltline now. It's Beltline adjacent at this point. But, at, you know, at the time that this photo was taken, there's the railway there. It's a post-industrial, just like in every sense of the word, <laughs> site. So, um, layers and layers of asphalt with gravel on top and then clay and then more asphalt and um, really poor soils. Um, a lot of, you know, machines and other things used to go in and out of the warehouse. So really compacted uh, and they wanted to turn it into an urban orchard. So this was the design. The idea is on the building here, which is on the right hand side of this frame. Um, there are louvered vents on the um on the face of the building and they can open them and then inside of that room they have what they call the crunk ship which is a, like a copper pan that's as large as the room is and they fill it with with a sugar water that can and then turn on the louvered vents and it pulls the ambient yeast from the fruit and we chose species specific um and varieties specific um specifically that uh fruit in cooler temperatures um, and then they pull that yeast into um, the crunk ship and then it inoculates the uh, sugar water there and makes very like flavor specific yeasts for sour beers. So that's the intention behind this. And also the function of adding in a lot of um, usable space and repairing the soils. That was our number one thing that we needed to do on this site was repair the soils so that they could support fruit trees. So we did this by doing a, a full meadow understory similar to what I was describing in the previous project. Um, and we planted all of the fruit trees to give you a sense of the soils when we started, we planted the fruit trees and then they were um, really happy, healthy fruit trees. And then the, the day after planting one of the pears, I came back and it had lost all of its leaves. It was just in complete shock from the the quality of the soil and then after it lost all of its leaves it flowered again in like late October so it was just a very confused plant but it completely recovered um, and then now you can see so this is right after installation and aerial view um, so there's some trellising there's tons and tons of fruit like Asian persimmon and American persimmon and pawpaws and hazelnuts and mulberries and um, apples and pears and figs and blueberries and pomegranates and loquats and so many things. So this was immediately after installation. Um, and then this was like two years after installation. So just seeing the, um, the change in the soils by planting native grasses and, and um, native perennials that really have deep tap roots, deep root systems that pull nutrients up. And then, you know, they were managing that by just letting it, kind of letting it go to repair the soils. And it's, you know, at this point, the trees have grown and um, the, the understory is flourishing. So there's a lot to be, there's a lot that can be done with soil. Um, through choosing for function when you're designing plant communities. And that overall supports your fruit production, which is you know, one of the primary goals of the food forest. So before we move into the q and I I wanna just leave you with this quote from Masanobu Fukuoka who wrote The One Straw Revolution. If nature is left to itself, fertility increases. I just think that that's a really, really important way to view um, working with nature, that our job is really to um, plant things that we interact with that really help to bolster the fertility of the site and to support all of the stakeholders, whether human or otherwise. Um, but ultimately, there's an intelligence to natural systems that really doesn't need us to do anything. And if left to itself, nature, um, if nature is left to itself, fertility increases. So I just want to say thank you so much for your attention this morning.
And if you'd like to find out more about building a food forest or dive deeper into permaculture or some of our um, course offerings, please feel free to visit our website. It's shadesofgreenpermaculture.com right there on the screen. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I guess we'll go into our um, Q&A session. Awesome. Well, Brandy, thank you. That I know I learned a whole bunch that I did not know. So that was that was awesome. Um, we have so far, there's just one thing here. Uh, somebody's saying, please do post the link to your blog about the Hugel bed. So um, if you if you can link it into the chat, I can grab it from there and also add it to the email that I will send out to everybody after as well. Okay, great. I will pull that up right now before I forget. And if you guys have any questions, go ahead and send them in. Okay, here is the link here. I'm putting it in the chat. But there we go. Awesome. Great. All right, and I am going to grab it as well so that I can add it to. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I see some folks putting um, messages in the chat. I'm really yes. excited that you got something from those projects. I was trying to choose ones from a wide variety and just give a sense that food forests, you know, because it's a buzzword, I think a lot of people have ideas about what it means, but it's really, um, it, I don't think food forests look any one specific way. I think it's really more about how they function that makes them a food forest than how they look. Um, so that's a, a really important point, I think. And then I see Galaxy tab A <laughs> asks, how can you hire us? There's a form on our website. Um, if you go to the connect tab, so it's shadesofgreenpermaculture.com forward slash connect. Um, and if you fill out that form there, it lets us know that you're interested and we'll set up a time to have a call with you and hear a little bit about your project and um, what your goals are and see how we might work together. So. That's a great way to get in touch. All right, we got another one in the Q&A. It says, do all these gardens require buying new soil given the Georgia clay? No, that's a great question. Um, if you're trying to go from like zero to 60 overnight and do a, you know, a, a radical transformation, then that's the point that you would, that you would buy compost or planting mix or other amendments. Um, but no, one of the things that we did, one of the reasons that we chose those native pollinator mixes to build soil is that most, uh, many natives, native plants um, really prefer slightly um, distressed soils. And it's their job to do the work of building soil back so that they're like working in succession. Some things that'll germinate in clay soils really make those soils favorable for other plants that require more fertility as they're you know, as they're germinating succession. So when you do a meadow from seed, like what we did at Monday Night Brewing and at the um, food, home scale food forest project that I showed, those we um, just lay the seed and cover it with straw. And in the first year, most of the blends, we use round stone seed, which is out of Kentucky um, for our native seed mixes. And they're all open pollinated and have 95% like germination rate. Um, really great, not the cheapest seed, but really high quality seed. And what you'll see if you work with a meadow from seed is you lay it down and there, most of those have some annuals mixed in that really just sort of like create some shade and some moisture in the soil. And then the perennials will start, um, will start germinating year over year. So it may be three or four or five years before you see all of the seeds that were in that mix begin to flourish. And it's really because perennials need certain set of conditions in order to germinate. Um, pH, rainfall, certain amount of cold days, um, chill hours, things like that. So those, those mixes are designed to allow for succession and species. So you don't need really, um, really amended soils for that. And then in terms of, do you need to import soil? Like at our house, when I started working in our garden, um, I don't know 
what the deal was, but I couldn't even dig in the soil with a shovel. It was such complex, compacted clay. And so what we did for the first few years, um, we didn't really do anything other than just continue to layer organic matter. So we would take all of our leaves and put it down um, on in the backyard. I live in a really tiny yard, so it wasn't, you know, it's a 60 by 100 foot lot. So less than about a 10th of an acre or so. Um, but the whole backyard couldn't even dig in. So what we did is we just layered our leaves and then the comp the cardboard and then our compost that we were making. Um, and then we would cover crop into that um, with things like daikon radish, like I mentioned, and a couple of other annual mixes. We grew some kale and things like that. There were just like green material. We would seed with buckwheat in the, in the summertime and then chop it all down, leave it in place, and then do that over and over and over again. Um, and then after about three years, we have amazing verdant, you know, great things that are growing and just really rich topsoil. Um, and it didn't cost anything to do that. Um, you know, if you're going to buy compost, it can be $30, $50 a yard. Um, so depending on your coverage, you know, you might need 10 yards or 20 yards. So it can, it can get kind of pricey to do it that way. But patience is your best friend when you're looking for um, the alternative to buying materials. Awesome. Yeah. And I see there's a question, what, re what's the meadow mix you recommend? Um, the seed company is called round stone seed, round stone. Um, and if you go on there, the, the meadow mixes that they have are really, really, uh, like ecotype specific. So you can choose full sun, wet for whatever zone we're in, in Georgia, or, um, they define zones different than the USDA hardiness zones, but they have a map there. Um, or you can choose full sun dry or erosion control mixes. If it's a really difficult clay slope without much topsoil, there's a ton of different mixes. So you can just poke around on there and they're all well designed. Gotcha. Let's see if we got any, <clears throat> anything else coming in. So I have a question based on you were saying to find plants that have multiple functions that you were talking about. What are some of your favorites that have those multiple functions that you like to plant or you have in your own space? Yeah. Um, one of my favorites these days is loquat, especially as our winters are getting warmer. We're starting to see them fruit more. When I first started working in Atlanta 10 years ago, they didn't fruit here. I hadn't seen them fruit and now I'm starting to. Same with pineapple guava. Um, but I like them. They fill the, the structure. They're evergreen. They grow in full shade or full sun. They have an incredible fruit. Um, so delicious. And they flower in the winter. So they're great pollinator forage for like late winter when the bees are starting to wake up. And um, yeah, just really wonderful, wonderful plants. Other things that I really love, I am a huge fan of mountain mint. I know I mentioned mountain mint a bunch. Um, I mean, it's got great volatile oils for pest control. It's incredible forage for bumblebees, a really important nectary, nectary source. Um, medicinal, like other mints are for soothing your stomach. And we use it in teas and pestos and um, grows really vigorously. It's beautiful, fills multiple functions. Cool. That's awesome. If you're a plant person, I feel like most of the time you can find a function with any plant yeah. that you love, you know? <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So we've had a few, a few more come in. One person said, you mentioned many different examples of plants for many of the different sides. Is there somewhere I can go to get those examples of plants for planting different areas? We have a couple of plant lists on our website. We've got one for, um, if you go to the learn tab on our website, some free downloads that you can get. Um, one for shade producing plants, um, shade food producing plants rather. And then there's one for uh, medicinal, medicinal plants that are gorgeous that you can add into your landscape. So those are the two plant lists we have currently available. And we're working on a plant database right now, um, which will be a membership site that'll launch this summer. So if you um, sign up for our website, that'll be 
plant list or sign up for our newsletter rather, we'll announce when that goes live um, sometime this summer. So it's another great place. We'll, it'll be kind of, a, we're doing it as a membership because it'll just constantly be updated information based on our work with plants. And um, we'll in that uh, be sharing our, just our database of all the different plants that we use and the functions and where they fit within the landscape and how to maintain them. And if you need, you know, cross pollinators or if you need, um, yeah, all the different things you might consider and putting awesome. those in and how to use them. So that sounds like an awesome resource. And I think the mm -hmm. next question kind of goes along with that. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, but they're asking, um, where do you get your plants? That's a question we get a lot. That's a great question. So uh, it depends on what it is. There are a bunch of native nurseries that are local growers like Baker Environmental um, is one that we use quite a bit. Beach Hollow, which just opened a location here um, in Avondale Estates on Clarendon. Um, fruit trees tend to be a little bit more tricky actually to get around Atlanta. You can get bare root ones um, in at Isons, which is south of the city but it's, I don't really love planting bare root. You have to do it at a very specific time and they're kind of hard to tend up until the point that you plant them um, and they don't have the best survival rate. So what we usually do, there's a couple great websites where we can get plants and then we'll pot them up and grow them out. So um, Oikos Tree Crops, which is actually based in Michigan. Um, they have really incredible like overstory and fruit producing trees. There's edible landscape, um, animal landscaping out of Afton, Virginia, which does mail order fruit trees, really high quality. And if you wanna take a trip to the mountains, um, and outside of Black Mountain, one of my mentors, Chuck Marsh, he passed away, but he had a, he had a nursery called Useful Plants. Um, and it's at Earth Fair, or not Earth Fair, Earth Haven, <laughs> the okay. um, eco village up in Black Mountain area. Um, outside of Asheville, North Carolina, and they don't mail, but you can take a trip up there and put in an order and, and get really high quality, like some of the best high, best quality fruit trees um, cool. that I've seen. So it's a great spot. Awesome. Yeah. So it sounds like a lot of different places, depending on what it is. A lot of places. Kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right, here's another one. What does continuously maintaining and caring for a food forest look like year round? Great question. Um, you know, it's not as much maintenance as if you're trying to maintain something at disturbance level, meaning that you're trying to cut it back all the time. So like mowing, for instance. Um, but there is a, you know, there's a fair amount as things are establishing, we usually say like the first five years are really the, the point that you're going to have to do the most maintenance. You have to do structural pruning on fruit trees for, to like maximize production. You really want to monitor for any pests, um, and intervene with that kind of early on. And then while perennials and ground covers are establishing, that's the point that you'll get more weeds. So, um, you know, there's really like a period of time where you're going to need to interact with it a little bit more. But then once the plants are established and kind of beyond that kind of early, the early succession years, then um, really minimal amount of maintenance. Like our, our spot, we just to kind of give you my own interaction with maintaining my yard. Um, we planted in 2014 or so. And for the first couple of years, you know, like I said, we were building soil. We did another big planting last year because we finally got to a point where we were really happy with our soil quality. Um, and we do very little maintenance at this point, like a couple times a summer we'll go out and weed or, you know, the main thing that we, we maintain are, is our vegetable garden because there's a lot of turnover between the seasons and more weeds and they tend to get more pests than other parts of our um, yard. So. At this point, you know, I would say probably like three to four hours a year we put in to maintenance. <laughs> Just that's not uh, very yeah. much. <laughs> that's awesome. That once you kind of get it going, it's it's pretty self-maintained almost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it really, you know, it really depends on what you're primarily growing, I think, in terms of how how much maintenance you will need. Some species need more than others, but yeah, not very much. There's yeah. a, a teacher, a permaculture teacher based in um, the Midwest, Mark Shepard, and he 
talks about the stun method, the sheer total utter neglect. You oh. see what happens. And I'm like, I, I have adopted that <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and then the plants that really want to live, you know, they do well at our house. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's great. <laughs> All right, if anybody has any other questions, go ahead and send them in real quick before we wrap it up. Oh, I realize I just sent it to the link just to the panelists. So here it is to everybody oh. um, for the Google beds. Great. Well, awesome. Thank yeah, you I so think much, everyone. Yeah, I think that's probably it. it doesn't like look doesn't look like we have any other questions coming in. So thank you so much, Brandy, for doing this mm -hmm. whole series. Like I said, everyone, if you missed the other two, um, they're on YouTube. And if you have any trouble finding it, just reach out to Trees Atlanta and we can help you get connected with those as well as this one. Um, this is recorded. So we'll go ahead and post this as well. So you can watch it back. Any information that you maybe missed the first time, since there was a lot of good stuff in there, you can go back and uh, catch on the second round. So um, thank you so much, Brandy, for all that great mm -hmm. information. My pleasure. Thank you so much for hosting. And thanks everybody for spending your Saturday morning with me. Yeah. Hope you have awesome. a great weekend and stay dry. <laughs> yes. Stay dry. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end it. Bye everyone. Take care. Bye.